Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Psychic Monologues. I am Dr. Ray Mitch, your host. I'm glad that you could join me for brief moments in time of your very busy schedule and take some precious time to spend with us and with me as we're talking about a variety of things related to uh, spiritual formation. Uh, just by way of brief introduction, I do this every time, uh, but the Psych Monologues is a podcast that explores the intersection of faith, psychology, and, and spiritual formation, and and the, it is it is uh, let's see it is the org, uh, podcast find my words here soon enough, but it is the podcast for uh, the Stained Glass International uh, SGI for short. The mission for Stained Glass is to equip, encourage, and empower the next generation of Christians to live authentically in relationship to Jesus, themselves, and others. And what we seek to do, and this is our bigger picture implementation, is to develop what I call outposts for the heart and communities for the soul. Some place where you can come out, come away from hostile territory and be able to uh, find safe people to talk to and interact with, um, and take your mask off and be able to take your armor off and uh, work through the confusion, doubts uh, of faith, of relationships, of all of those things. And it is really the place where you can find that you can uh, belong before you believe. And ultimately, we I believe that certainly Jesus provides us a context for knowing ourselves better, ultimately, because of our relationship with him. And that does that and anchors it. The reality is a lot of people have fled from the church because of the lack of integrity around that message. And so I want to take time in these outpost groups to provide a place to explore and ask questions and deal with doubt and confusion and hurt, lots of hurt, uh, to be able to uh, walk back into perhaps a relationship with Christ. It is not a requirement in any way, shape, or form. It is some place to be able to explore and decide for yourself, not in reaction to the hurt that you may have, but in reaction to the, what Jesus calls us to and what he empowers us to do in relationships. So that's one thing. The other ministry of SGI is to uh, lead and conduct silent retreats for young people. Um, and we have another one coming up. I just finished one. I did a review of that not all that long ago. And uh, this one is going to be this weekend, and uh, we will talk a little bit about that at the very end. So where were we? We, we left off with uh, the broken people of the Bible, and I, I mentioned then that I, and looked at the story of Jairus and his daughter who had died and, and all that happened around that. And, and really the focal point was, what does Jesus do with our grief? Because we're like Jairus. Um, we're out of options, and then we then we suffer um, extreme grief in losing somebody. But we we talked last time about loss comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. It's not just with people dying on us; it's also with the loss of a dream or the loss of the self that we thought we would have by this time, or whatever that might be. And all the same issues apply. It isn't always just from death. Now, death actually brings that into clear focus, but it's only a part of it. Now, the question I want to hit on, that there is a story within the story of Jairus, um, and I, ironically, when you think about it, it's kind of strange that Mark would decide to put this story embedded in the larger story of Jairus. And to me, I don't know about you, but to me, Jairus is saying, wait, I thought you were coming to talk to, to to heal my daughter, and now you're allowing yourself to be to be in, interrupted, and and interrupted to get to help my daughter. You're being interrupted by this woman who is soundly ostracized in the culture that she's in, and it it she wouldn't even be touched. If anything, she would be outed um, in a lot of cases with the people around her. So. Um, what I want to look at is what does Jesus do with our shame and and how that fits into this bigger picture and this bigger story of this woman 
<clears throat> because there is a profound story within a story. The thing is, is that this woman and Jairus have a lot in common because Jairus was already unclean because he had touched a, a dead body or at least was around one. And this woman was unclean because of the, the flow of blood, discharge of blood, whatever you want to call it, that she was involved in. So um, with that, uh, we, we're going to look at this story. And last week, we looked at Jairus and, and all that he went through. This week, we want to look at um, the shame. And before I do that, I want to do a real quick review for you about what shame is, just so we can put this in a proper context, because I think this particular story hits at how we tend to deal with things that either have happened to us or things that we have done and the amount of shame we feel as a result of that. So what is shame? And the thing to keep in mind here, and this is particularly true in this story, is it is connected to our identity. It's not about necessarily our behavior. And in her case, it's even less about her behavior because it's a physical malady. But it's connected to our identity, and it is from rejection and disconnection that it occurs. She, dare I say it, was the poster child for this. And ultimately, shame in that culture and in ours is used to change somebody else's behavior and protect ourselves. Now, today, we wouldn't be protecting ourselves from somebody that has a flow of blood because we have, we have doctors, and probably this woman experienced some kind of uterine d- disease or, or problem, a, a, a disease, yeah, I'll stick with disease. And, and so it wasn't like she was, went looking for it. It wasn't like the woman at the well who had, had five husbands already and had gone through all of those because of how she saw herself. But the thing to keep in mind is that we lack the vocabulary to describe this thing called shame. And without those words, we lack the ability to expose it. So for her, this was completely normal in the culture that she was in completely normal. And ironically, it's completely normal in ours. We don't even see it. I have so many stories of of the students that have gone through my shame and grace class, and they become highly sensitized to the fact that they are marinating in shame. And they have no way to describe it because we have no words to describe it. The reality is that we only experience it and and we experience it as this profound level of self-loathing or hate or <clears throat> um, this amount of critical condemnation that goes on within us that is always there. So shame, the actual definition of it is this intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. (coughs) Excuse me. So, in her case, her body is very flawed. Now, in our cases, it's flawed in other ways. It may not necessarily be from a physical problem, but it is because of that. And the, the, the reality is, is that guilt and shame are based in some kind of self evaluation in one form or another. Usually guilt is because I did something bad. My behavior is compared or my performance is compared to some standard. Shame, on the other hand, is I am bad. So now it's my person that is compared to some standard. And again, in her case, in that culture, and you can do a further uh, deep dive into that, it's just how much in that culture it was... It was, I am bad. In, in a lot of ways, the, she was seen as suffering the consequences of some sin she probably committed. So guilt is about our performance, and shame is about our person. And performance can be adjusted. It can be changed relatively quickly. And, and when we do that, generally, even in Christian terms, we use the word conviction, But shame is about my person, and that can't be changed easily. In her case, it was particularly 
profound because she tried. She tried a lot and couldn't get anywhere at it at all. But now this is <clears throat> this biological anomaly is now compared to and connected to her worth as a person. And so she tries and tries and tries, and we'll get into that in another in in a minute here. But ultimately that shame gets internalized into I don't deserve anybody's time because I am so worthless and uh, unworthy of any anybody's um, attention at all. And when you think about it, that was embedded in her story as well. So shame is always about those. We have our condemned parts of ourself that are now being exposed. In her case, the condemned part of herself was her body. Her body, and so often, so so many times I've talked to, particularly women that have significant self body issues, body uh, uh, body image issues. So it the body condemns themselves as a person, and so self loathing comes up, and in a lot of cases, our thinking goes right along with it, fits right into it, and we end up understanding exactly why people don't like us anyway because of what is so wrong with us. So all of that, with all that in mind, let's take a look at what the, the actual story is. And I'm, I'm going to read and stop just to make a few points along the way, just to make sense of it. So it starts out with a great crowd followed him. That's Jesus. He has now come back from uh, across the Sea of Galilee where he, he met with the demon-possessed man. He comes back. Jairus meets him. Jairus deserves attention. Jairus is a, a, a you know an administrator of the synagogue. He was well known to people and to the rabbis, for that matter. So we have this juxtaposition of people. We have a person who is heavily embedded in the culture, very respected, comes up to Jesus, falls in front of him, and and Jesus responds and says, "Let's go. Let's let's deal help. Let me help you with your daughter." So we have him, and then we have this woman who we're told, uh, and I'll go on from there, he's followed by a great throng of people. They are thronging about him. They are pressing in on him. And there was a woman, I'm reading now, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians, has spent all that she had, and was no, no better, no better, but rather grew worse. Now, let me, let's unpack that for a second. Like I said, a discharge of blood. Now, if you know anything about the Mosaic Law, women, when they were, were experiencing their menstrual cycle, they were considered unclean, and they had to wait a period of time before ever being clean enough to come back into the synagogue. So this woman has it 12 Years and think for a minute. Let's just say that she was 30, okay? I don't know. I'm just making that up. But let's say she was 30. So 12 years before, she's 18. And and she begins to have a flow of blood, blood initially. They, they, you know, for anybody that, that knows anything at all, most women would know this is the start of their monthly period. So do whatever you got to do. Be done with it. Go through the rituals and go back into uh, the synagogue and into family life and, and community life. But this is 12 years. So over that amount of time, with all the time that was was. G- transpiring, Mark adds an interesting little detail because he says she suffered under many physicians. Now, I can tell you from having, having, I have chronic pain. I am in pain all the time. I went through a five-year period, and this that's only, you know, like a little over a quarter of the time compared to this woman, not that we're making any comparisons, but 
I went to doctor after doctor. I had more spinal taps than the taps that they have at a tap house. I mean, it was crazy. And eventually I got to this point and said, forget it. I'm done. I am just done. So Mark adds this interesting little commentary that she suffered under many physicians. And I can tell you from my experience, not during that time, but my experience, there's a lot of money that goes into seeing these physicians. They spent, they, these are specialists in, in modern times. They, they're not cheap. Thank goodness for insurance in that case. But it, a lot of time is wasted in doing this. And during that time, you cannot forget that <clears throat> our thinking begins to change little by little because the hope that starts out with maybe maybe this will resolve itself, things will get better, and I'll be better, and I'll be good. But over each time that you go and get bad news, it gets worse, and your thinking turns to, what's wrong with me? I mean, what, what have I done to deserve something for all of this time? So this is the equivalent of a child coming into kindergarten and graduating from high school that's that amount of time. And we're told she spent all that she had. She suffered under every doctor that came along that said, maybe I can help you. And was and literally, he says, was no better. As a matter of fact, she didn't get better. She grew worse with each time. And before too long, you grow into resignation. And the, each time changes our thinking a little bit more to be consumed by the shame that says, my identity is tied up in this. That is all I am. That's all I'm good for. Um, I just leave me alone. I'll be live ostracized. Now, there were people outside of the community that were also part of this group of people just like her, right? The demon-possessed man we already looked at, lepers, and they were completely driven out of the community. As a matter of fact, they ended up living in their own communities because they wouldn't infect anybody else. Sounds a little bit like COVID, but I won't get into that. And then she was no better, and each time she met with a physician, it grew worse. So hope is dashed over and over and over again. And Proverbs tells us that a hope unfulfilled crushes the heart. And we have a woman here who is crushed of heart. She has lost all hope. Now, let me read on. She heard reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment and she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. Now, stop for a second. Let me ask you this question. How is, he, how is she viewing him? Because there, the, she heard reports that he was a healer. And that she could see him. And maybe he could do what doctors have not done. So something penetrates her lack of hope at all. And so, but the thing to keep in mind here is that she's viewing him as a means to an end, not as a person to touch her. Not at all. As a matter of fact, she did thinking for him so that he didn't have to even pay any attention to her at all or see her or anything of the sort. And that's exactly what shame tends to do. It drives us to see ourselves as an object to be fixed rather than a person to be healed or cared for or touched or seen, seen. And that's a significant conclusion to make about oneself because that's the conclusion she had made i'm not worthy to i'm not worthy to be touched or seen or cared for or encouraged 
or any of those things. All I am, I am is just an object just to be fixed. And she saw him as a means to that end, not as a person to see her. And you got to take the gravity of this in. And as I've said before, wherever looking at these stories from the Bible, they're just two-dimensional. They're not people. And I'll bet, I'll bet you anything, you have met people that have grown so hopeless about whatever their condition is or the things that they're going through or you're going through. You say, why bother? Why bother? It's not going to make any difference anyway. And God, even God doesn't want to help me. And all of that same thinking was contained in this woman. She was there with you thinking just like that. And so she didn't think she was worthy of his time. And she saw him as a means to an end, more like a religious relic rather than the son of God. And so she said, well, I don't want to put him out. I am such a burden. I'm too big of a problem for him. I, I only want to touch his garment. That's all. That's all I need. So I'll, I can touch anybody's garment, but his, wow, that's different. And she had faith, but it was faith that was tinged with this part of how she saw herself. And the thing I want you to pay attention to is we can never entirely divorce our view of ourselves and our view of God. We can't divorce those things from one another. Because how I approach God has everything to do with how I view myself. Who am I? And am I worthy of God's attention? Or is he so profoundly disappointed with me and all that I tend to do or not do or I don't perform the right way or I, I'm not cleaned up enough or whatever it is, so let me get cleaned up first, Jesus, before I come to you. But in her case, that was a dead-end street. She had tried it 12 years running, so she was out of options. I think there's plenty of that to go around. And in a lot of cases, people will come into a church feeling exactly the same way, and all they find is be warm and well and be on your way. Not not from a malicious intent at all, but more out of a fear that if I can't help you, then what? The reality is, is that if we see these stories as they really are, as three-dimensional people with three-dimensional problems, with three-dimensional pain then probably we will see ourselves in some way with this person. And so she sees it this way, she frames it this way, and I would suggest to you that a lot of our view of God is just like hers. God is a means to an end, in other words, an object, rather than a being to know. And we are a being to be seen and known. So these two things go together, and they are very much a part of what we're talking about here with a broken person view of God. And we're not, it, it's not us and them. They is us. We are them. And if we understand that, this is the basis from where compassion flows. Because I can see some commonality with the other person and what they are experiencing. So what we're told, John Mark continues, and it, Mark says, and immediately the flow of blood dried up. She felt it in her body that she was healed of her disease. So, so far, her way of thinking, her way of acting, and, and she already knows about being ostracized. She knows that she's running the risk of making Jesus unclean by touching him at all. But she chose the hem of his garment because that's at least the least exposure he would have to someone like her. And it works. 
and it works. Her view of herself and God has worked so far. And so often, I think this is exactly what happens, is we, we come, we're driven in to find, trying to find God somewhere, and it works. Oftentimes, we'll find people that are more than happy to give us a simple answer to a very complex problem. And it's like, just confess your sins and you'll be well. Yeah, but there's more to that. And so it works. And it, he, it, 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 and she says, there, that's all I need. And she slinks back into the crowd to try to disappear. But there's something that she didn't count on. And that is Jesus being God perceives in himself, and I'll go back to reading, perceives in, in himself that power had gone out from him. And he mer- immediately stops. Now this is, this is putting on the brakes and turns to the crowd or in the crowd and says, who touched my garments? And his disciples are going, huh? Are you kidding me? There are all these people around you. They're pressing, uh, pushing in. And you're going to say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. So Jesus stops. He slams on the brakes. Everybody, you can credit this is almost a comical scene. He's walking along and the crowd's flowing along with him. And then he puts on the brakes and everybody kind of slams into the back of him and his disciples. And he says, who's touched me? And, and they're like, come on, Jesus, really? How, could, how can that even remotely be? But he's serious. He is dead serious because he knows someone has touched him. And he probably knows... Who has touched him when that happens? So now he stops and he looks around to see who did it. Now, she is caught. She is completely caught in her shame. And ultimately, the thing about shame is sooner or later, it catches up with us when somebody wants to see us with compassion. Because our shame is shattered because their compassion sees us as a person to be seen and touched rather than a object to relate to. And so she confesses and, and then watch his response. She confesses. She said, I did it. I did it. And you can see it, right? The crowd kind of parts, and she's stuck right in front of him, you know, on her knees probably in front of him, and says, I, 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 it's me. I did it. I touched you. And he, his response is incredibly telling. There's more to it than meets the eye, again, as usual, right? And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And be healed of your disease. The thing I want you to not miss is he addresses her as a person. Daughter. Daughter. Let that sink in. You are related to me. Daughter. He shot past all of her shame, all of the shame she had experienced for the last 12 years, And he saw her as a prized person to be loved and cared for and not shamed and ostracized. He immediately inducted her back into the family of God. That is who Jesus is. That is who he is. He looks past all of the crap, all of the condemnation that we pile on ourselves for not performing at the perfect level to be worthy of him loving us. And he looks past all of that, looks past the stained glass that I was talking about a few weeks ago and sees us as we are and loves us as we are. Not as we could be or should be. He loves us as we are. And he goes and says, go in peace. Now, this is completely in contrast to the last 12 years a pursuit that she has been in, putting on these heavier and heavier garments of shame and saying, take all that off. You can go in peace and 
and be healed of your disease. Be healed. Be complete. Be whole. Shalom has come back into your body, my daughter. This is for you. I can tell you more often than not, when we see ourselves in, you know, you know, called out from a crowd, there is one of two things that are going to happen. Either we will be told that we are prized and loved as we are, and we say, no, 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 that is not what the voice has said to me, or we're being called out to have more shame put on us. As a matter of fact, most of the time we cringe waiting for it to come because the shame narratives have just flown off the handle in our heads for it. But Jesus looks at her. He looks at her. He sees her. I, I can't help but think in my mind's eye, and I, I have nothing for this, all right? But her head is bowed. She won't even look at him. Given what her approach has been with Jesus, she won't even look at him. And I, I, it, I could, to me, and this is just me, but if I were Jesus, and I'm not, thank goodness I'm not, but I would bring her head up and look into her eyes and say, daughter, your faith has made you well. And guess what happens? For me, if I were her, I'd crumble. I would completely crumble at the immense amount of grace that's being shown me because I can bet you a dime to a donut. Didn't, probably didn't have those back in those days. But I can bet you that she had not heard daughter addressing her in a long, long time, at least 12 years. She was never addressed that way. And to be addressed by someone of Jesus' stature is like being called out expecting shame and being called out and being sh showered with grace and hope and recognition of her being, being important. So that leaves us with one last question, and that is, what, what about us? How much are we like her, right? Because we think oftentimes those same thoughts. You can pick whatever area you want that you have condemned in your life and in your heart and say, that's that. That's that area that seems to be unhealable is br so broken that Jesus doesn't want anything to do with it. And and the reality is, is we cordon off that part of our heart, and then we go on and do everything we can to compensate for it so nobody really looks there. And so when somebody offers us grace, when we finally get around to revealing that area to somebody, it it is so completely unexpected I can tell you from being in groups and people admit things that they would never admit in any other context. And the first thing that happens to them is their eyes go down. And as me as the group leader, I'm looking around at people and seeing what they're doing. And usually nine times out of ten, maybe more than that, if there is such a more, 9.5 times out of ten, People are looking at that person with compassion and grace and sensitivity and feeling with that person. And I literally have to say to the person, look up and tell me what you see. And when they finally look up and they look into the eyes of compassion and grace, they crumble, understandably, they crumble but they also have a little bit of their heart given back to them by the people that have shown the compassion and grace, dirty secret that they won't give to themselves, but they can give it to somebody else. If you're in that group, take a number. So Jesus' approach to our shame is to offer us our personhood back. 
Now, again, it could be a part of our hearts that we've cordoned off and we've condemned it and shamed it and covered it over with all of that stuff. But Jesus says, here, I want to give this back to you. And you can grow and you can have the grace to grow and follow, bring your life and your beliefs and things in alignment with me and you will find healing there. It's not going to be immediate. It's going to be a journey and you're going to need traveling companions. But Jesus' approach to our shame is he recognizes and reaffirms our relationship with him. That is the first thing he did for her. He didn't say, you know, be healed or peace, go in peace. He didn't say that first and then say, daughter. He says, daughter. He reestablishes his relationship with her. And he does that with us as well. And then secondly, he re recognizes and reaffirms our personhood, our identity that has been preserved in that relationship with Jesus. You may have all sorts of beefs with Jesus or with the church or whomever. And I get it. I understand. I've, I've, I've been there. As I often say, been there, done that, got the t-shirt and went home. But if, if we're willing to reconnect our relationship with him and learn as we go while he walks with us, because that's what he'll do, then maybe we might learn something new about ourselves or find what grace really looks like and trust his evaluation of us that we are prized and loved and seen, then how would your day be different if you actually believed that you were God's beloved? How would your day be different? How would you see yourself different? And that's God's approach to our shame. It is not pull yourself up by your bootstraps, quit being so prideful, quit being so perfectionistic. You'd, he doesn't start there. He starts with, remember, you re remember your relationship with me. Let's start there, shall we? And then, here's parts of your heart back. And then, let's walk. Let's do it differently. And w like I said, we need traveling companions to do that with us. We can't do it alone. There's no way... We would like to do it alone. I've had more people than I can count anymore talk to me about getting over a sexual addiction or pornography or anything, and they don't want to talk to anybody about it because of why? It's condemned parts of themselves. And I say, you need other people who have been down this path to talk to about it. And they say, oh, no, I could never do that. that and and I, I generally I'm saying, if you, if you really want to change it, then you better find some people to walk this path with you because you are not going to walk it alone. Because the very nature of what we're doing to comfort and deal with our shame within ourselves is done in private. It is done behind closed doors. It is done in shame. And shame to, cannot survive in the light of grace and grace shown to us by the people in our lives. It just can't. So that brings us to the end of that and that picture. And it's a profound picture that I don't want you to miss. Okay? So that's it for tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you can always DM me on Instagram as usual. Um, and it's not like I'm bombarded with the questions. But if you have any, I'd be curious to hear and, uh, and curious to hear your comments and thoughts about it. You can always subscribe on the, on the website at drmitch.com. Um, you can follow us you know, in, in any of the social media that we're involved in, social media like Instagram. Uh, we can be found at the Psych Monologues. Facebook, Ray.Mitch, M-I-T-S-C-H, and LinkedIn, D-R-Mitch. You, you can find us in any of those three social media outlets to be able to be a part of it. Um, and if you're interested 
and you want to try to get relationships rearranged around some of these things that I'm talking about. We have devotionals available on the website under CCU. You'll find setting new boundaries. It's a devotional to help you uh, put relationships in place in healthier with the boundaries that are needed for healthy relationships. You'll find them there as well. There's a subscription there that would support the efforts of SGI and the silent retreats as well. So you can subscribe. If you want to do a month and see how it goes, you will get an email in your inbox every three, three every two or three days. Uh, then it's variable. Um, and you'll be reminded of, of what boundaries look like, healthy boundaries look like in relationships and how you can have healthier relationships that way. So that's, uh, you can subscribe monthly, you can subscribe um and semi-annually every six months or annually and we would be ever so appreciative and grateful for your support of SGI it is a tax-exempt organization we survive on donations um, and all the things that go into it um, if you're interested in partnering with us not only with that but also with uh, supporting our silent retreats we have one coming up like I mentioned we I've been trying to and I say it every podcast to grow the scholarship fund for people that are wanting to be a part of the silent retreat but don't have the funds to do that and in small ways i've been able to do that with some of your generous donations but you know just to be blunt we just need more we need more not only to put a website presence in place that is robust enough to support our uh, online groups but also robust enough to be able to provide videos and training materials and other things for leaders that might be interested in our outpost group. So uh, y- you can you can do that. And, and there's a donate button at the bottom of the the front page, the home page, uh, for, for at drmitch.com, and you can say donate now, and you can designate how much you want if you want to do it. A continuing donation again we would be very very grateful for that if you'd rather do a physical check you're welcome to do that as well just make the check out to stained glass international the address is sgi p.o box 322 east lake colorado 80 oh man and my it's 614 that's it there you go i lost my place so um you can do that at the p.o box 322 east lake colorado 80614 make it out to sgi or stained glass international either one and and we'll be happy to send your receipt in our appreciation and grateful gratitude for your involvement with us well that's it for tonight thanks so much for joining me Thank you so much for the time. I hope that it's been an encouragement to you. If you have any questions, let us know on the website or uh, your interest in outpost groups. You can also get involved there. Uh, You can find those on the the, um, CCU drop-down menu. There's outpost groups. Um, Taking names uh, for people that are interested in getting involved, maybe getting some training to be able to lead a group wherever you are. The beauty of online groups, of course, is that uh, we're not bound by uh, location, physical location. So if you're interested in either of those things, hit the website under the outpost groups. You can always access them by bit.ly.com slash outpost underscore groups. You can uh, sign up that way as well. Probably the easiest way is just through the website. So That's it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. I am um, honored and um, um, humbled that you would take time out of your busy schedule to spend time listening to some of the things that the Bible has to say about not only our relationship with God, but with ourselves and each other. And that's the the focal point of what SGI is all about. So uh, I'm not going to say it again. That's it for tonight. Love you. Later. Bye.